Welcome to Every Nation Sunning Hill this morning. We are in the middle of a global pandemic, but that doesn't stop us from praising God. Amen. This morning, we're going to actually be taking our eyes off ourselves and onto God. Sunday is going to preach a powerful message this morning called Worship and Warfare. At times like this, how do we approach God and actually draw strength from Him? I've got a couple of announcements before we get to the word for this morning. First of all, this Friday evening, Friday the 3rd of December, we have marriage and pizza. I want to encourage you to make every effort to be part of this opportunity. We've got a special guest speaker, Paul Nyamuda, and he's going to be helping to enrich our marriages. You might not, not be married, you might be thinking about marriage, and I want to encourage you to come along to Marriage and Pizza as well. It's going to be a phenomenal evening. If we've got COVID restrictions, we'll be communicating uh, during the course of the week, and we'll possibly just do it online on Zoom. But it's going to happen this Friday night coming up. This Sunday coming up, the 5th of December, we have our children's production, and that's going to be an awesome time. Again, if we are on COVID restrictions, we'll figure out a way to put it online. So much great stuff is happening this week. And finally, we had an opportunity during our service this morning to celebrate our Leadership 115 team. We had four people graduating, and I'd like to say a huge congratulations to the four of you. Well done for showing yourself faithful, and I know that you've been blessed by the content you've covered this year, and God's going to release you more and more in ministry. And we can all look forward to Leadership 215 that's going to be starting next year in February. Watch this space for details. God bless you and look forward to seeing more of you online and in person. For freedom's sake you gave your son to die Adopted us from darkness into light Now I am safe within your loving arms And I can hear the yearning of your heart For the love to be, to be, as we can hear we call Sons and daughters For the lost to be, to be We can hear it calling Make our hearts beat and beat and beat and beat with you
Remember last time we mentioned that heaven is a worship-filled environment. The 24 elders are there, doing their thing before the throne. The four living creatures, they are there declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The two cherubs are before God on either side, declaring that he is God and he is holy, and there is no one like him. There is no preaching in heaven. It's just worship. That is the scene that is set from beginning to the end. I quoted the scripture in Ecclesiastes that the chief end and the duty of man is to love God and to enjoy Him forever. We then went on to examine the Old Testament priesthood where we mentioned that priests were a called out people 
who were selected from among the nation of Israel to present themselves before God and function in the ministry of the priesthood for all the different duties that they performed in the tabernacle which God had set up via Moses in the wilderness as they were making their way from Egypt through to the promised land. We saw the scripture there in number 16 where God said, The Lord will show who are his, who is holy to, and will cause him to come near to him who he has chosen. So that speaks of the Old Testament priesthood, a select few. But then again we went on to the New Testament priesthood, where we saw in 1 Peter 2, verse 19, you can put it up there. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, you that is, today in the New Testament priesthood, we discovered that. You are a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out. So unlike the Old Testament, where there were a select few who were called out to the function or the ministry of the priesthood in the tabernacle, you today, you and I, are that royal priesthood. We are the new priesthood who have been called forth to declare the promises, the works, the wonders of God who has brought us out of the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Again, we saw that in the New Testament priesthood, according to Hebrews chapter 13, it is said there, by him, Jesus Christ, therefore let us offer to God the sacrifice of praise continually which is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to him. Again, in 2 Peter chapter 2, somewhere, it speaks about us being the church that is being built by God, brick by brick. You are a brick on top of another, fashioned by God, into a temple where his spirit will dwell. To offer again, it says, continually spiritual sacrifices, which are acceptable to God, in and through Jesus Christ. So that is our New Testament role, our New Testament priesthood, the honor that we have, we discovered. And we touched on particularly the tabernacle of Moses and its significance in relation to spiritual realities that were to come. God gave very specific instructions to Moses on how that tabernacle ought to be built and the furnishings and the items which were to be placed in there. They had pure significance and they actually spoke about Jesus Christ. For example, at the gate, when you came through the outer court entering the tabernacle, the first item you see there is the bronze altar where, you see, let's just look at where Christine is sitting right now. Let's imagine that the door is the gate coming in, all right? Where Christine is sitting, you would find the bronze altar where the animal sacrifices were done, okay? The animal which was to be sacrificed was brought and killed at that point, all right? And we move forward, okay? Maybe just about three chairs in front of Christine, you would find the brazen bowl or the bronze basin which had water in them, okay? Where the priest, after sacrificing, they would wash themselves and cleanse themselves and then they entered the holy place, a tent, okay? And within that tent, you would find, let's say, where Steph is seated, the lamp stand, okay, with the seven um, candles, which was the only light one which was to be found in the tabernacle. Okay, that was there. And now where, please just wave your, your hand, lady, yeah, the one with the white jacket, okay, where she's seated, you would find the table with the showbread, okay, which had half loaves of fresh bread, consistently speaking about God's provision to the 12 tribe of Israel. And then when you came to where these cameras are, you would find the altar of incense. Can you see something shaping up? Okay, the altar of incense was where a specific type of incense was burning right through, which was a sweet smelling fragrance to God, talking about the prayers of his people. And then there would be a veil, I suppose, let's just say at this point, which separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies, okay? Here was the Ark of the Covenant, which had inside the tablets of Moses of the Ten Commandments, okay? It had 
era of God be started with those rebellion and over the leadership, etc. But the Ark of the Covenant spoke of the presence of God, where God dwells, and he, his pillar of fire and of cloud rested whenever the tabernacle was set up. It rested from this point. Now, as I said, from where Christine was, where Steph was, where the lady was, and coming through, can, can you see a shape there? The cross. Thank you, Greg. That actually spoke of what was to come. In that shape, in where these items were placed, they actually signified the cross. And it spoke of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. He was the one who was slain. He was the one who was sacrificed. And his blood brought by the priest eventually to be presented to God as the ultimate atonement for all our sin. Jesus Christ, the light of the world, the lamb which was found there. And there is no other way to the Father except by him. The table of showbread, Jesus Christ being the bread that was broken, his body which was broken for us. The intercession and altar, Jesus prayers and his speaking of our, on, on our behalf to the Father constantly for the atonement of our sin. And in him and through him, we are then justified and sanctified by the same water which the priest used to wash. I mean, speaks, the Bible speaks of the word washing us as if, as in the fashion of, of the word renewing us in that sense. And then ultimately, Jesus Christ presented himself, his own blood, to the Father as total satisfaction for the righteousness of God. Okay, so all those things were very exacting. They were very precise. The tabernacle of Moses spoke of the holiness of God in contact with the sinful man and how that was to be navigated. It was very, very fearful. It was not to be played around with. Even when God went to the mountain of Sinai and brought the tabernacle, when people were invited by God to come, but there was thunder and lightning there. It was a very scary picture. People were afraid and then they actually sent Moses to go and hear on their behalf what God was saying. So that book of perfection, the standards there against the holy God in relation to us were totally, totally not to be trifled with. That was the tabernacle of Moses. And also remember we spoke about then the, the tent of David. Remember how the ark was then brought from the Philistine camp back to Jerusalem. It wasn't taken back to the tabernacle in this instance, but David just pitched up a tent, any ordinary tent, and he put the ark of the covenant there. But God actually didn't even mind that. Why at that instant? Why wasn't God as exacting about you know, the priests who came once a year only to bring the atonement in the tabernacle. And if they were with blemish, if they had sin, they would be struck down by God in the Holy of Holies. But in this instance, David just pitched up a tent without God's instruction. He put the Ark of the Covenant in there. And people were invited 24-7 here, appointed musicians to come and play and sing 24-7 not following those exact laws that were predicated in the tabernacle. Why? Why did God suspend his laws at that time? Because he spoke again of spiritual realities that were to come. How God in his mercy would suspend his law to allow people to come in. He spoke of situations where we could come in. It wasn't Jews anymore. It certainly wasn't the high priest coming in once a year. But now even Gentiles were actually part of David's tent. It wasn't just Jews who went in there. They were before the ark. Specific, oh, I forgot my phone in the car, but it speaks about little points there which happened in that same tent where people clapped for the first time. Most of the Psalms which were recorded were actually composed during that period in David's tent. It speaks about Gentiles and Jews coming in together to worship God. God didn't mind that. It spoke about David tapping into the very mercy and grace of God according to the covenant of Abraham. David stepped beyond the Mosaic covenant of law and works. He tapped into the Abrahamic covenant, which is an everlasting covenant, which supersedes all other covenants. And he went into the mercy, he went for the jugular, the very mercy of God 
and he touched God's heart because that was all that God was ever about to restore his people back to himself. The law was there to show us yet how sinful we are and what was needed to be navigated before a holy God, yes, but there was a, a superseding covenant where God was always the man who was after our hearts and he always wanted to dwell with his people. So there in David's tent, he dwelt with his people and he didn't strike anyone down at that point and people worshipped there. And um, he speaks about um, guitars and all sorts of things happening. People offered spiritual sacrifices from the songs they sang, not the animal sacrifices which were found in the tabernacle anymore. Now people were offering from the abundance of their heart spiritual sacrifices to God with the covenant in front of them. Anyone, not just the high priest, you and me, is spoke of things and realities that were to come. Amen. All right, so that's the long recap. Now let's speak about worship in the sense of warfare and what worship does to God and what worship does for us in relation to who God is. Okay, Psalm 22 declares, God is enthroned on the praises of his people. Like Peter had mentioned earlier, we are as living stones, being formed and built together as a temple to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. God dwells in our midst. One of the names of Jesus Christ was God Emmanuel, Jesus Christ in our midst. That is what heaven's object, heaven's object When you realize that Jesus Christ was the object of the affections of heaven, he was the perfect son of God who came down to be with us. The heart of the Father in reaching for sinful man like you and me was without bound. God wanted us so desperately to be deep back in relationship to himself, he sent the very object of heaven to come to it himself. He wouldn't trust the prophet anymore. He wouldn't trust any other person anymore. He had to come down himself. Okay. So sometimes when we grasp the truth of that, and we actually see our relationship in the light of God as a father, not an exacting God who is out to hit us the moment we mess up, it will inform how we then approach and respond to God himself. God dwells with us in the midst of the church. He is enthroned on the praises that we offer up. His rule, his kingdom, his character is established in response to the praises that we offer up. Now obviously this week we've heard very bad news about this new variant etc and it's just caused waves across the nation. It's had all sorts of impacts you know, for our nation in relation to other nations flights cancelled, you know, us being barred from going to other nations, etc, 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 and all the economic consequences that are being um, seen, you know, so obviously everyone is in a bit of a state. But then what does that say about who God is at this time to us in view of all this information coming in, rushing from the north, the south, the east and the west? Where do we focus our attention? Do we see Jesus Christ or are we going to see the reality that is in us? And do we respond therefore to the reality that we see and hear? If God is in our midst, we need to enthrone him rightfully by what we speak, by what we say in response to the situations which are very real, I'm not denying them, but then what does God say? Who is God in the situation for us? God dwells with us on Mount Zion. 
David pitched his tent in Jerusalem, in the vicinity of Mount Zion. This is not Mount Sinai, where Moses got the tabernacle, the fearful sight, which I recounted earlier on. This is Mount Zion. And here was the church of the first wall. In Hebrews 12, verse 22, in fact, let's just go there and read it. And see where we are located, where we are positioned. Is it up there? Can you put it up there if you can? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. In fact, I'll take it from a bit earlier. I will read it from verse 21. Okay, now take it from 22. But you, speaking to us, you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Not in fearful assembly like Mount Sinai, but in joyful assembly. To the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men. To the spirits of righteous men made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator and perfecter of a new covenant. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than the blood of Abel. So that is our location today. We are the presence of Mount Zion. This is where God is to be enthroned. Okay. So it's a joyful assembly in this instance. This is where God will issue his decree. This is where God will issue his judgment from Mount Zion. Okay. Now there are a couple of other scriptures which speak about this mountain. Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 to 9. We can put that up and just read it together. Should I read it? Okay. Perhaps I should read it. Oh, in this mountain, Yahweh of armies will make all people a feast of choice meat, a feast of choice wine, of choice meat, full of marrow, of well refined choice wine. In this mountain, in the joyful assembly. So there is a celebration which speaks about the authority and the throne of God, okay? In this mountain, let's go to the next one, Isaiah 31, verse 4, speaking about the mountain again. For Yahweh says to me, as the lion, as the young lion growling over his prey, if a multitude of shepherds is called together against him, he will not be dismayed at their voice, nor avail himself of their noise. So Yahweh of armies will come down to fight on Mount Zion and on its height. Basically, there the lion being God, representing God. God will not be moved by all sorts of voices from shepherds and people throwing stones, trying, trying to chase it away. God will growl and protect us, and he will fight on our behalf. From Mount Zion, and he will not be perturbed by all the noises which come from the shepherds wanting to chase him away to remove him from his agenda. And I'll read chapter 66 of Isaiah for us. Particularly key. Verse 6 says, Hear that uproar from the city, hear that noise from the temple. It is the sound of the Lord repaying his enemies all that they deserve. From the sound of what is happening at the temple, at Mount Zion, the noise, the uproar that is coming from the temple, the music, the worship that is breaking forth in all sorts of directions from the temple, will be proportionately what God will do to the, his enemies or the enemies of his people. So as God receives and responds to our praises, to our worship, he will deal directly to our enemies on our behalf. 
So really the Mount Zion speaks about his faith, his, his faith of total authority in our lives and through all the affairs that are happening in any given nation. But God responds directly in proportion to our worship. To those spiritual sacrifices which are being offered up, God will then usher forth his judgment. Psalm 149, verse 6. I will hop through a couple of scriptures so that we see directly how God is relating and navigating all these things. Psalm 149, verse 6. Oh yeah, there it is up there. May the high praises of God in their mouth and the two-edged sword in their hand. When you actually go back to the beginning of that chapter, it says, Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king, the one who is in authority in Mount Zion. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with tambourine and harp. For the Lord takes delight in his people and he crowns the humble with salvation. May the praises of God in their mouth and the double-edged sword in their hand, they will inflict vengeance upon the nation and punishment upon the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with shackles of iron and to carry out the written judgment against them. That is the glory of all the saints. With the high praises of God in their mouth, and the two-edged sword, which is the word of the Bible, in their hand, they will carry forth the written judgment. They, you and I, not God, you in, in and through your worship, when you are praying with the revelation of what is happening, you will carry forth the written judgment of God over the nations. You will bind the nobles and the kings, the strong man you will bind and just rout him. But God does that in response to the high praises in our mouth as we are delighting in God, as we are singing to God, as we are worshipping God, God moves on our behalf. And with these weapons that we have of praise and God's word, we will proclaim God's kingdom to be the everlasting kingdom of light, of hope, of truth, of healing, of joy, of life, God will bind the nobles and the kings and the principalities and all that is said against God's people in this generation. He will bind them in response to the high praises. Worship and worshippers are the key to delight in the heart of the Father. And it will overthrow principalities and confuse power in its execution. Proclaiming the written judgment prophetically, shifting dynamics over us as a nation, as a city, over our families, over our health as individuals. Wars, famine, poverty, all those things, all those things which are said to oppress the people of God. All those things we will proclaim as the saints and issue forth judgment against. That's actually a privilege that you need to you realize you have. When you worship God, you're actually issuing forth the written judgment against all these bad things which I've mentioned. God does that in response to our worship. God prophetically moves in our families, in our lives, in our nation, in direct proportion to the level of worship that we bring to Him. That is warfare. Not in the sense of addressing the enemy. We are aware of the enemy and his schemes and his devices, but we just address God. We lift up our eyes to Mount Zion from whence our help comes from. In direct response to that, God issues forth from our lips the written judgment. And he will then scatter all that he needs to scatter and rout the enemy. As David, remember, when he samad to God, sama is a Hebrew word for worship, to touch the strings of me. When he played that harp, well, the tongue today is terminology, when he touched the Strings prophetically, he spoke to God, he ministered to God, and the demon manifested in Saul, and they fled from Saul's life. 
So it is with us. Your warfare, your worship must focus on the high praises and the enemy will be taken care of. I mean, church, we have to agree that when all sorts of oppression and suppression and situations come to you as an individual, as a family, as a nation, the normal response is to, to go into fear, into panic mode, because you're so aware of what is overwhelming you. But when you break forth with the high praises in your mouth, that ought to confuse how. That's not the response which is supposed to emanate as a result of the situation you're facing. Am I correct? But when you respond in faith, when you raise up your song, when you raise up your eyes and you look to God and you magnify God in the situation, hell has got no counter to that. The assignments which have been sent to you are totally neutralized before then God acts on your behalf. We have to understand that we need to establish a supremacy so that the ground truth can move in. I mean, that's just typical of the war that we see in our day and age. When you've got air power and you sort out the air dynamics, the ground truth can then move in and take ground, and take ground from the enemy, and take the spoils of war as a result. You know, let's read chapter 30 of Isaiah. That leads to that point particularly. Can you put it up, sis? Isaiah chapter 30, verses 27. And I just want you to see what God is doing here in response to our worship to Him. Is it up there? Okay, you still get there while I get there as well. Isaiah 30, chapter, uh, chapter 30, verse 27. Okay. See, the name of the Lord comes from on high, from afar, with burning anger and dense clouds of smoke. His lips are full of wrath and his tongue is a consuming fire. His breath is like the rushing torrent rising up to the neck. He shakes the nations in a sieve of destruction. He places in the jaws of the people a bit that leads them astray and asunder. But you will sing as on the night you celebrate a holy festival. Your hearts will rejoice as when people go up with the flutes. To the mountain of the Lord, again, the mountain of the Lord, the rock of Israel. The Lord will cause men, now hear this, the Lord will cause men to hear his majestic voice and will make them see his arm coming down with raging anger and consuming fire, with cloudbursts and thunderstorms and hail. The voice of the Lord will shatter Assyria and his scepter will strike them down. Now note, every stroke the Lord lays on them with his punishing rod will be to the music of tambourines and harps as he fights them in the battle with blows of his arm. Amen. 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 I don't need to add on to that. Just note that scripture. If there's any scripture you need to take away with you is Isaiah chapter 30, verses 27, towards the end of it. God will respond and God will act. God will judge. God will strike down in response to a joyful celebration happening at the mountain on Zion, where the temple is, where you are seated, where you are positioned to offer up spiritual sacrifices, the fruit of your lips. Now, the fruit of your lips comes and must come from a revelation and abundance of your heart that knows God. Amen. You can't just sing when you come every Sunday because it's the dark thing. Okay, it's that part of the service where we must just sing and follow through. You need to sing in your own time based on the revelation of who God is. Remember the first song we did in Christ alone that just speaks on the cross of what Christ came and did for us, of how we are justified in faith at what he has done. When that is your location, when that is your position upon which you are founded, upon which you stand, upon which you are made righteous before God, you are part of Mount Zion Church. Not Tempest standing here before us. Certainly not me as the lead worshiper. Never mind those times we are all worshippers before the Ark of the Covenant in David's tent. Every one of us, from the least to the greatest, we have access. We've been given that access. But that comes in 
the understanding that we must know God for ourselves. In our private times, get into the Word, have God reveal Himself to you and to us. And we know Him who we worship. And the extent of your worship is based upon the revelation and the truth of Him revealed to you. Your worship is based upon the revelation of the truth of God revealed to you. Access Him, church. Access Him for yourself. We all have need for Him. And the Bible promises us and says that we've all been given what we need for life and for godliness. Jesus Christ. We are partakers of His divine nature. We are in Him. We rest upon Him. When God sees us, He sees the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice of His Son speaking on our behalf. Access Him. Remember Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Remember also that the Father seeks those who worship Him in spirit and truth. And those are the only people that the Father speaks about that Jesus came to seek. The Father came to seek. The lost, you and I, once upon a time. But He also seeks those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. That again speaks of the privilege that we have. First, as a people called forth from darkness, sorry, into His marvelous light. We were lost, but now we are found. But secondly, as worshippers, not the guys who are on the stage worshipping and playing instruments, but you and I on Mount Zion, worshipping God. God seeks you. God wants you. God wants to dwell within you. God wants to dwell beside you. Knowing your standing before God is very crucial. Your life is a testimony of His grace and of the new birth. Retreat into His unchanging nature when you're confronted by all sorts of things in your life. Take time out and retreat. Go and see. Go and remind God what He did for you. Go and see yourself as the testimony that you are. Remember God's miracles. Remember God's provision. Go back and speak to Him and declare to Him that He is faithful. Go back and declare to Him that He is just. He is true to you. That He will not leave you. That He will not forsake. Remind Him of all those covenant promises that He spoke about you. Retreat into His character, into His very nature. And then when you come out with a new understanding again, reminded again, issue for those spiritual sacrifices. Sing songs that you never sang them before. Be particular about what songs you sing, because not every song necessarily edifies God in the dimension of gospel music or in the dimension of worship. Some things magnify other things and they actually move away from the true God. Be very careful what you say and what you sing in view of the realities which are presented to you. Amen. Amen. Recall his mercy, proclaim his miracles, remind him of his rescue, retreat into his faithfulness, root yourself there, then worship with understanding. He responds out of who he is, but then he acts from the position of who he is. He will respond in delight out of what you say to him. The joyful assembly with songs, with tambourines, even with tears flowing down your tears flowing down the cheeks, right? <laughs> <laughs> Crying in your bed, exasperated, overwhelmed by a situation. Even with those tears flowing, sing. Sing with understanding. Prophesy over situations in your life with the pain which is searing in your heart, with the child that is sick before you, with the job that is on the line, with the business contract that has, that has been cancelled because of Omicron, whatever it's called. Even that name of Omicron must bow down to the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we sing with understanding when we are confronted by situations in our lives. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Turn the tables on the health agenda in terms of your health, your finances, your city, your nation. And with praise, prayer, and prophetic, launch your faith toward heaven no matter what. Responsibility to fulfill the covenant that you established with Abraham, Lord. You took responsibility to administer it, you initiated it, and you must therefore be the completer of it, Lord. We just stand as beneficiaries to that. Therefore, O oh Holy God, we present ourselves to you in view of all your mercies. We come boldly before your throne of grace this morning that we may find help in our time of need. Holy God, we raise this offering to you, Lord, in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ. What he has completely done on our behalf, you know, Lord. And we stand, Lord, in faith before all that, trusting you again. We have trusted you before, and we still dig in our heels to trust you now. And we will trust you in the future, Lord. Because you are from everlasting to everlasting. You are unchanging in all your ways. You are beautiful beyond description. We ascribe to you holiness. We ascribe to you wealth. We ascribe to you divinity. You are holy, you are holy, you are holy, Lord. And even as the 24 elders and the four living creatures, Lord God, and all the hosts of heaven see you seated upon your throne, they see aspects of you being shot off and revealed at every given moment. It's an eternal adventure of realizing of having revealed for us who you are again and again and again. You are unfathomable. You are unending, Lord God. And therefore here, in this location, in Mount Zion, Lord God, in, in a joyful assembly, Lord God, we lift up our praise to you, thanking you for who you are. Amen. Amen. Which you can play the next special song. As we worship God, let's stand together, church. With the